So, um, uh, first of all, uh, as, as, uh, as mentioned before, I'm uh, Yael Levin. I come from uh, political uh, from uh, political science, specifically uh, uh, political psychology. Uh, Gadi, who is going to we're going to split our we're going to split our uh, lecture. Uh, Gadi comes from is is an expert in in, in, uh, in Palestinians. Um, and uh, our department is the Department of uh, Middle Eastern Studies and Political Science. So I come from the political science part, and uh, and uh, Gadi comes from the Middle Eastern part. And uh, uh, not because we are in the same department, but because who we are, we uh, cooperate. And some of our some of our um, researchers are mutual, and this is one of them. And in this research, we tried to look at something that has to do with the conflict in, in the Middle East, but we started by taking it from a broader, uh, a broader view. So I would speak about the broader view, and, uh, and Gadi will take from there and speak about the, the, the local view. And what we did is this. We, we, uh, we start with some theory about narratives and what a national narrative is all about. And um, if you take national narrative, any national narrative, you're going to find that it usually has three bases or three components. The first component, and I'll speak about each of them separately, but first of all, the, the first component is collective victimhood. Second component we're going to speak about is a feeling of victory. And then the third component is uh, universal justice. So we'll speak about each of the components, but let me say one word before that. What, what exactly is national narrative? So national narrative is actually the story, the collective story that we tell ourselves about ourselves. Uh, Yuli Tamir once said that uh, national narrative is the story that uh, we, we tell our children before we put them to sleep. It's always a nice story. We never tell bad stories about ourselves. And it doesn't matter who ourselves are. We always tell nice story, stories about ourselves. And our nice story is built from three components, but I will start with other narratives just to give you an example. I could take any example. I could take any country. I could take any nation. But let me, let me take just three, three nations as, as an example. And I would take them from the least expected place where we could find those three elements. And let, let me start, for example, with, uh, with the British people. And the British people have a narrative where they, are, they have a collective victimhood and the feeling of victory and universal justice. And let me, let me uh, uh, elaborate on those. First of all, collective victimhood. If you didn't know, the British are victims. They are victims because they are the underdogs. Now, this is true even in the midst of the British Empire, when the British, when the British actually uh, occupy uh, India and, and, and the Middle East, they are victims. They are victims because they are the underdogs. They are the underdogs, and all the, all the territory that they hold has only one object, to keep the little island, we are a small island, and we're against the whole world. Even when India is theirs, they're still a small island, and it's an element of victimhood because they always have to defend themselves. And the fact that they were never conquered ever since 1070 has nothing to do with it. They're still a victim. And since they, since they uh, uh, fight against the whole world, the feeling of victory it's not just a victory, it's a victory against all odds. The British people have, have, uh, have a, a struggle against everybody, and they always win. But the winning is not only technical, there's something very moral about their victory. It's a, it's a universal justice, because actually the British people, in a way, are the new Romans. They are the defenders of the Western world, of the Western culture. Now, if you take, for example, not the British people, but let's say, um, let's take, for example, the Germans. The Germans are victims because the Germans are stuck between the West and the East. They have the French 
from the, the, the French from the French from the, the West, they have the Russians from the East, they are victims, they have to fight for themselves. And if they win, when they win, it's against all odds. It's them against the whole the whole world of enemies. And it's a universal justice because they have the people and they need the living land, the Lebensraum, and it works. That's that's why they win. And if you want to go east, you take the Russians, the Russians are victims, and they're the victims of the West. Whenever the West is able, they tread on Russian on Russian land. They've been doing it ever, ever since the, 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 the war in Crimea in the first in, in, the, in the beginning of the 20th century. They've been doing it when there was a revolution in Russia. Whenever there's an opportunity, the West is against Russia. But Russia always wins against all odds. And the universal justice is sometimes is about the Russian land and sometimes is about ideas such as, such as the communism. And I could go on and, and, and uh, do it with uh, almost every country that you think about. Let me, let me give you, back to, the, back to the British people, let me give you just a small example for something which we ought to, uh, uh, to bear in mind when we speak about narrative. There's not necessarily a direct connection between narrative and facts. Sometimes there is but not all times. And going back to the British, let me give you the, the example of the, the Battle over London. In the Battle of London, I was raised up to know, for example, that the British were the few. Uh, Winston Churchill said this, uh, this uh, sentence, uh, never did so many people uh, uh, owe so much for so few people. And he spoke about the British pilots. And the British pilots fought so bravely over London against the, the, the mighty German air force that kept, uh, kept uh, coming over and over again and attacking uh, the island. That's the narrative. The facts are slightly different. And the facts are slightly, not, not totally different, but slightly different. The first fact is that in order to fight the British fighters, the German fighters had a long way to do all the way from Germany to England. So once they arrived over British soil, they were in a disadvantage because they had very little fuel and they had something like 10 minutes, 10 minutes of fighting before they had, they had to head back home. Otherwise, they would just fall. That's a great disadvantage. That's the first thing. Second thing is that the British were the last to bring new airplanes into the army. Once you're the last, your technology is better. So when war breaks out, the, the, the British t technology is better. The third point is that the British were not so few. Because by the time the Battle of Britain took place, the British had hundreds of Polish pilots, who were excellent pilots, Czech pilots were excellent pilots. They had a great reserve of, of pilots. They were not the few. Actually, they were the many. They had the advantage. These are the facts. They are slightly different than what we learned in high school, but they have nothing to do with narrative, because narrative is actually what Churchill coined. We are the few. We are defending ourselves. Um, we, are, we, we won against all odds. And this was, of course, for the, for the sake of the free world. So this, this in, a, in a, a nutshell, is what national narrative is, is all about. It's a story. It's a good story where we are the victims, we are the heroes, and we did, and do it for some moral causes. And it doesn't matter on, 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 which, side, on which side we are or, or which, uh, uh, which country we are. This is, this is more or less what I, uh, what I could put in, in theory. Perhaps later we'll go into more details if, if you have any, any questions about it. And I think that's a good point, a good point in time to go to, to Gadi, to your part. Thank you.
Thank you, Eyal. As Eyal said, my name is Gadi Hitman, uh, and it's, if you don't pronounce it perfectly in English, it should be with K, not with C, because I'm not Hitman. But uh, that's okay. Uh, it's like, it's just like Uzi Hitman. He was my, he was my cousin. Uh, but this is not the story here. Um, as Eyal said, I'm coming from Middle Eastern uh, uh, school. I've, I've worked for 45 years for the Israeli government and retired four years ago. I uh, remember you quite well from uh, joint uh, discussions here and there. And uh, I wrote my PhD about the Israeli of minorities seven years ago in bar uh, University at the Department of Middle East. And ever since I wrote four books, two about the Israeli minorities in Israel, the Arab minority in Israel, especially thanks to Samira, who is here. She helped me a lot while being in Givat Chaviva. And uh, my upcoming book is about the Palestinian rift between Hamas and the PA uh, by the State University of New York Press. It's about to come in four months' time. If you want, you can have a copy. And I also wrote a book about the Saudi Arabia, which is a very interesting uh, country. But uh, I'm, uh, I was listening to a and I was looking at you. And it's quite amazing to look at Israeli audience hearing stories about Britain, Germany, and Russia and national narratives without saying, oh, that's a good story for, for, for dinner. Look at the people on the screen. And we were focused on the, the second intifada between, actually we were focused at the beginning on the first intifada, but then Eyal called me one day and he said, you had to change it to the second one. And I said to it, Eyal, the literature review is already written. Why should I change it now? He said, because that's what I want. And he's the boss. So that's exactly what I did. And you know, you know exactly in the army how it works when the boss wants something. And Eyal is still have a military thinking up to day. Uh, sorry, Eyal, I had to do it. Uh, now let's go, let's go to, the, to, to the research itself. It started one day in our room in, at the university uh, uh, negotiating over uh, narratives. And I, I told Eyal, I will write a book about it. And he said, go ahead, I'm not joining. And I wrote a book about the Palestinians' arena. And then he said to me, but we can do something different between, let's check between the Israelis and the Palestinians. It's amazing to see how Israelis or Jews and non-Jews, uh, Arabs within Israel or Palestinians are seeing themselves in, in the right, uh, very same uh, 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 microscope when they talk about national narratives. What we did in our research between 2000, when the Second Intifada broke out in September, uh, up to Arafat's death in November 2004, we made a mixed research, both qualitative and quantitative, in, in this way. Uh, Eyal checked all the public uh, appearances of Ariel Sharon, because he, he, was, the, he was charged on the, Ar the Hebrew side, and I was uh, charged on the Arabic side, and I, I checked uh, Yasser Arafat uh, uh, public appearances. Uh, it appears that between uh, October 1st, 2000, up to his death in November 2004, the last his last public appearances was in, back in, in early in October, and then he became sick and died. Arafat was uh, uh, talked. Arafat talked about the national narrative, the Palestinian national narratives, uh, more than thousand times in four years. And if somebody wants the, the, the right number, the, the, the accurate number, it was. 100,081 times that Arafat talked in the Palestinian press about the national Palestinian narrative. I've checked all the three daily newspapers between October 2000 to November 2004, El Quds, El Ayam, and El Hayat El Jadida. All of them, every day for four years. And I, 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 I didn't go further from that because I realized that the Palestinian press is actually covering every single word that Arafat is saying, whether he is speaking to Israelis, to Palestinians, to Arabs, or to the international community. So wherever he uh, wanted to say something about national uh, ethos, he knew exactly uh, how to do it. In each time that Arafat spoke about the Palestinian situation comparing to the Israeli one, he was the victim 
he was the right side. He was sure that he's going to win, and he, and, and, he, and he clearly stated, if we win, it will be a universal justice. Uh, some of you, you probably for sure, just as I remember, knows exactly that between 2000 to, and 2004, um, we had some uh, severe escalated uh, situation within the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Uh, just in 2002, we can uh, remember protect, um, a defensive shield, defensive shield uh, operation in Jenin, just after the terror attack in the Park Hotel uh, in Atania. And then in July, uh, we uh, attacked uh, Salah Shkade in, uh, in, in Gaza Strip, uh, the military uh, leader of uh, Izzat al Qassam brigades of Hamas, and was uh, killed. And if you see how many times Arafat spoke about how poor and how miserable he is between March 2002 to uh, August 2002, it's 100 times. And you have to read it very carefully to see whether he's changing something due to the Israeli policy, because we put him under closure in the Mukata in Ramallah. And uh, uh, if you want some uh, anecdotal story uh, from, that, uh, from these days, uh, I guess most of you, maybe all of you, are uh, familiar with the name Christiana Amanpour. She was the senior uh, correspondent of uh, CNN in the Middle East. And she, 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 she required and received accepted an approval from the Israeli authorities to come to Ramallah to interview Arafat. And there is a very famous picture, which of, of course was photoed and was uh, published all over the Palestinian media at that time. Uh, it was in May 23rd or 22nd, 2002, just a few days after Jenin, which he called to Jenin, Jenin Grad, like Stalingrad or Leningrad. And she asked him, how do you feel as a Palestinian leader to sit here in the Mukata when you, you actually you are under closure of the Israeli authorities, and he got so mad at her. So he, he knocked on the table and he asked her, how dare you ask me the Palestinian symbol of the Palestinian national ethos? Ask me such a question. I am a man. I am a Palestinian man. And you ask me why I am under closure? Ask Kavya Sharon in Jerusalem. It's not my, my it's not my, uh, 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 part or job to answer it. It's not my, uh, uh, I'm not supposed to answer about this question. Uh, we, we, may, we, may, we may look at it in a funny way, but that, that's what we were thinking. Uh, every time when he left Jenin or, 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 or Nablus or Ramallah, and he headed to Egypt or, or, or Tunisia or elsewhere, he used the Arab summit to, to, uh, to introduce to the Arab world uh, how miserable are the Palestinians. And uh, I can go, I can go further with that, uh, but I think that that, that point is, is is quite clear. Not surprisingly, when you look at our relation one speeches at that day, and I'm, I'm just recall all of you that we are under terror attacks almost on a daily basis from the Palestinian uh, different groups, from Fatah and Hamas, uh, Palestinian Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and and others. Whenever Ariel Sharon addressed the Israeli people, and it was not 100,000 times, it was much more less than that. Uh, rarely, expre rarely appearances at the Knesset or, or, or the press, and Ariel Sharon, by the way, he was not such a big uh, a fan of, of talking to the press. But every time when he did address to the people, he, quoted, he, he almost quoted Arafat. We are the victims. We are going to win this battle against the Palestinians. There is no way to do a peace with the Palestinians unless they stop fighting us. And when they stop fighting us and we go to, to a peace, to a real, real, real peace process, uh, it will be a, a universal, a universal a justice. Um, uh, it, I was quite surprised to see that in 2000, uh, both leaders are, uh, which, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, they never met. Although Ariel Sharon sent his son Gilad or Omri to, uh, to, to, to try to, to see if there is any, any chance to mediate with or to talk with Arafat, uh, address their people with, with the same with the same language. So what we find here in our uh, uh, 
in our research. Uh, by the way, we are uh, we have in, we are intending to elaborate this research uh, uh, in 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 the few coming months, starting from Balfour Declaration to uh, 1948 uh, Civil War, 1947 to 1949, and then uh, other uh, some historical points to see whether something was changed or not in the. Uh, in the, in the story of building narratives or national narratives. But as far as we find, we, we, so far we can conclude as such. First, this is a theoretical tool to, to see what, what keeps intractable conflicts uh, to remain intractable. But more than that, and that goes maybe to what Ival said this morning about some kind of a vision, how can we change the narrative? And, and you can look at the, and, and, and on the slide, on the right side of, of the slide, and you see how to change a narrative. Uh, it, as you said, you are not a, a romantic and naive, and it's not going to happen tomorrow morning. But the the, in, the national discourse and the, the regional discourse and the international discourse should be changed if you want to change. If we if we want to change, and when I say if we, I'm not talking about only about Israelis, I'm talking about Palestinians as well. And when we're talking about Palestinians, we are talking today about two different entities, which are splitted more now 14 years uh, to two different geopolitical entities, which have different, uh, different ethos, different narratives, and perhaps even different identities, although all of them will state that I'm Palestinian. But each one of them in Gaza or in the West Bank will define Palestinian in a different way. So it's, it, this, looking ahead, this is two challenges for Israel, one in Gaza and one in the West Bank, and not necessarily the same, the same uh, comprehensive peace or agreement is relevant for the both, for the both regions. The, the other thing that we, found, that we saw through uh, Sharon and Arafat uh, speeches is maybe quite obvious, but somebody has to explore it, that we are tracked in a fundamental barriers of psychological, and this is your uh, uh, expertise, we are tracked in a psychological barriers which none, of, and maybe you, somebody here, I think it was you this morning, call it the, the lost decade, and we didn't do something to solve the problem, the Palestinians didn't do as well something to solve the problem during the last decades. And despite the fact that we have some several peace accord or normalization accord with some Arab states, the Palestinian issue, whether we are recognize the Palestinian identity or not, it doesn't really matter what we think as Israelis, it's much more important what they think about themselves and what story they tell about themselves every night before they go to sleep. The Palestinian issue is still here, and, 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 it's, and, it is, and it's an Israeli one, and nobody is going to solve it uh, for us uh, unless we uh, will do it for ourselves. So uh, in that point, I, I find myself uh, agree with you that we're really not using all our capacities uh, smartly uh, to move forward for the uh, benefit of the Israeli interests. This is something that we find in, in uh, uh, the research. And finally, uh, some things that we cannot uh, uh, run away from it to skip it uh, from this uh, 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 short discussion, the, the cycles of violence, or perhaps sometimes vicious violence, uh, remains the narratives alive. And some political elements in both sides use it very, uh, I don't know, smartly, very cleverly, let's say, to remain in power. It serves political interests in both sides, and uh, and we as people from both sides continue to suffer uh, from time to time. Uh, I can conclude by saying that uh, in, in in my course at, at Ariel University, when I'm teaching uh, 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 about the, 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 the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians, by the way, until lesson number six in the in the course, I never used the word Palestinians because they never called themselves Palestinians at least until in 1919 uh, or 1920, 
uh, when the students looked at me, they asked, okay, so what can you tell us uh, to summarize this course? And I said, okay, let's, we, can, we can finish it in three sentences. Since 8060, we kill them, they kill us, we kill more, they kill less, they, they will continue to kill us, and we will continue to kill them. It sounds very depressive. I know, but if you want to change, we have to change the narrative. Thank you. I must uh, point out that uh, narrative is artificial. It's not like we have a narrative because that's the way it is. We've been born into it. That, that's not the story. Narrative is what we decide it is. And if I gave, if I gave the, the, the British example, uh, Churchill pointed, Churchill coined the, the, the coin and, and, and structured the narrative uh, at, at that point in time. Uh, our narrative, uh, both the Israeli narrative and the Palestinian narrative, is artificial. So uh, addressing, addressing is probably something that, that, that is ought to be done. But I think that also a change can be put inside. Let, let me give you a, a small example. You, um, you mentioned that uh, we are uh, victims of the Holocaust, which is perfectly, perfectly right. It's, it's, it's correct. The question is, what do you do with this victimhood? Do you call the Green Line, for example, uh, which I, 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 I come from Ariel, I, I totally, I don't think it should be there, but do you call the Green Line the Auschwitz borders? That's taking narrative into a very specific place. Do you take the Holocaust into Judah and Samaria? We are there because we were in Auschwitz? That's a great question. So the, if, even the victimhood, which is objectively, we've been there. We are victims. It, it's, uh, you have to make a decision what you're going to do with it and how far you're going to take it. Okay, it, it's artificial. It's not. Uh, yeah. It's not something that. It's totally art artificial and it's understandable. If I may add, and it goes more to the strategic um, uh, word, uh, perhaps, and and maybe to the um, uh, to the future, to the vision one. Uh, I can mark three, di three different cycles of how to change the narrative. It should, st it, it should start with the leaders uh, from both sides. Maybe triple sides, because we are talking also about, talking about Israel, Palestinian Authority, and Hamas. Uh, then we, we, we talk about education. If you read recently, and I believe you didn't, but if you read recently the Palestinian education books about the history of the Palestinians, and you see how Jews are introduced there, problem. The same problem is here with us when we talked about uh, on, on, on Palestinians in the, in the Jewish or Israeli educa education system. I'm not putting the blame on, on, on this side or on the other side. The third one is the media. But in order to do it, somebody has to, to, to put the vision. And I think from all since the morning, the only one who put any kind of vision If I look at Palestinians, we are not there. I may say carefully, just as an, not as an expert, like, like, no, we are not there. No situation that we are all, maybe we are all in an intractable political conflict within the Israeli political system. It's not, this is it, it's not going. Where? Because in order to do it, you need a, a wide basic at the Palestinian side, both in Gaza and are not ready. And I can give you an example, the narrative. How many times did you see during the last decades Palestinians, thousands of thousands of thousands, go out to the first bank trying to identify with the borders in Gaza? Not so many. And if they come, they're coming by 
not more than 200, 300 to, to, to the main squares, in Manara, in Tulkarem, in, in, why? Why they are not putting the, the why they are not ready to risk themselves as well for the narrative? For the Palestinian national vision goal, okay, which is there. Because since 2005, something has changed there, within the Palestine and the West Bank. It changed because Abu Mazen changed the, 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 the discount of terror attacks, trying moving to more, or let's say, popular protest uh, uh, demonstration as well. And Israel agreed that Abu Mazen will take and build the Palestine upcoming bottom to up with Salam Fayyad, and then with, then with today with Muhammad Ashtaya. We interrupt them. Because and as long as we can do our security activity as well as a settlement activity in the West Bank without any objection, Palestinians or Muslims, it's fine with us. Now, by that, you are not in the narrative that this is Earth Israel, it always was us, and now we are putting his Jews. It's us. But the, it, Oh, okay. I'm putting myself in a situation that I'm building my civilian institutions uh, from bottom to up with the Israeli uh, permission, and I'm not doing terror. From time to time, we know that the, there is the, there are terror attacks. I'm not ignoring that uh, point, but we are not changing the narrative. We are not ready to do any. A, a tiebreaker a, a steps, not us and not them. So it's nice to be, a, I'm, and because I'm coming from the real world, to, because I was there for 25 years, I can tell you that it's much more easy to say to, to sit in Ariel and not in the in the Kiria in Tel Aviv or elsewhere and and break your head. Okay, think out of the box what I'm doing now. It goes back basically to leaders between 2009 to 2021, Netanyahu. And it doesn't matter if I vote for Netanyahu and if I didn't vote for Netanyahu. That's not the issue here. Netanyahu did absolutely nothing to uh, advance the, the issue with the Palestinians from his reason. That, that's okay, politically. But the problem is, is here to remain that the narrative didn't change. If it changed, it changed for the worse. So us, or it's all theirs.